Welcome back to the Redacted Culture Cast. For the last couple of weeks, I have been rather focused in on drawing a, dis- a distinction between a von Clausewitz perspective of warfare and one of Mao, and the difference uh, in the somewhat it's argued over translation of von Clausewitz's on war, you'll hear people say things like war is politics by another means. And it's John Keegan in his book, The History, A History of Warfare, helps illuminate to the reader that what von Clausewitz might have or probably meant and understood in that description was that he was viewing war as primarily an action between nation states or even by definition Warfare is restricted to violence between nation states because of its own definition. Whereas Mao, as we've seen in the past, Mao's view of violence, especially warfare in this sense, included a very strong cultural element too. We see this distinction reflected in American culture as well as in the world at large by how different groups, parties, and organizations view their, or draw out and view conflict in general. For example, the right in America generally views warfare and violence from a von Clausewitz perspective, where there are rules of engagement and battle lines and distinctions between combatants and non-combatants, and that a war has generally a beginning and an end. Whereas the American left, in its cultural war, particularly sees warfare in a cultural sense as well that warfare is also a conflict between cultures. The contrast here being that von Clausewitz sees it as sees war as a conflict between political systems or politics, political states. Mao can see it as a conflict between cultures. And of course, this is the redacted culture cast where we are talking about philosophy and the philosophy of violence and how we understand violence. And so before we go on, we're today we are going to be talking about three terms and we're going to be talking about them on both sides of Hume's fork. We are going to be talking about the is in reach of these topics, politics, economics, and culture, as well as the ought, how we understand and framework the idea of ought in politics, economics, and culture. Before we go any further, if you are watching on YouTube, thank you very much. We have been growing a small but steady pace on that platform. We, as anybody is familiar, since this content can be easily attributed to something like gun culture, which we do ourselves, uh, there's a natural incentive for social media to have less motivation to share our content, which is the long-winded way of saying it's hard for us to get the word out, but we believe that it is worth doing anyway. So just because it is not easy doesn't mean we don't do it. And you can and you can follow us on YouTube, and that would be a huge benefit because we've recently been monetized despite the fact of what we talk about. As well as on Instagram right now, we are getting dangerously close to that important hallmark of 10,000 people. Uh, we've almost got 10,000 people under the redacted support group or the, adapt, or I'm sorry, under the redacted page on Instagram. And the goal there and what we recognize that the platform is useful for is that we're, that is where many of us reside. Lately, I've been putting out every weekend a, a, a snippet from our workbench, which are little tips and tricks that I've learned over the military, over years in the military and outside, whether it's contracting or world travel, that particularly make our lives better, especially in sort of the conflicts, conflict and preparedness arena. But on top of that, Instagram has also been the platform that I continue to use because that is where most of you interact with me. So if you could, and if you would do this for me, we'd like to try to hit 10,000 people by the end of the year. And that is the ad space for today's episode. So let's get into the subject. Politics, economics, and culture are three different things. They are three different things that interact with one another when it comes to the human experience of society and otherwise. You will see this talked about on the academic level most oftentimes as politics, economics, and philosophy. We are going to insert, instead of philosophy, culture today. 
Now, politics, in the, as described by von Clausewitz, is a political system. It is in, in the is side. We're going to be talking about the is and the ought. The is side, perhaps I should restate what Hume's fork is and, and what is and ought mean. Is is a bridge. A bridge, a science is the realm of is. And so science is the realm of is when it comes to what a bridge is made up made out of and it involves our senses and how we perceive the world it is not well it's not just how we perceive the world sorry it has to do with in some ways the material the material aspect or in the cases that we're dealing with today because we're going to be dealing with abstract objects politics economics and culture the is side of today's conversation will be mostly described in systems so even though a political system is an abstract object it is still an object that we engage with we might try to change it, maybe try to understand how it functions, what it's, and then, and what it, uh, how it operates like. The ought side of the question is going to be primarily rooted in what are the foundations upon which, what are the imperatives upon which these different systems are organized? And so we'll start with politics as an easy example. Uh, for those who are in kind of the libertarian camp who have not read Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia, I'll just challenge you. You're not really all that libertarian. Uh, now, that sounds like a bit of a dig, but generally speaking, Robert Nozick should be understood as sort of the one of the fundamental uh, pieces of literature regarding libertarianism. And the first question that he asks is... Before we are going to talk about, or if we're going to consider polit political philosophy at all, we must first ask the question, why the state at all? If we're going to ask how a government should function, we, were, we first have to ask the question about why it at all. And so the is of politics is the state. The state, the way that people interact with each other, how people spend, how how uh, a, a nation state organizes, what it is. We have things like uh, we have republic. We are, I'm sorry, we have political systems like a republic, like a democracy. We have things like a monarchy or despotism, and then we have communism. And so, politics is primarily the apparatus, usually in, instituted in some sort of codifications, usually written out in law, or some form like that on how people function in regards to a state this could in another another way of dealing with this too though is also looking at something like nationalism and i'm not talking about whatever the left is calling nationalism today i'm talking about nationalism as the view that the best way that a people a people localized to an area should be understood as is a nation nations have borders Nations are a collection of people who live in an area who supposedly, this is where we see the other things come out, share common uh, culture. <clears throat> so the term nationalism came out or, 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 or arrived on the world stage in uh, around the time of the French and American revolutions. And the, American, and the French Revolution is a good example of this because it was a distinct turning point in French history where people no longer saw themselves as servants of the French king in a monarchic political system, but changed this into, instead, instead to a form of nationalism where they saw themselves as citizens of France. So the state of France, another way that you could look at it in the interaction of political systems is which precedes which, the nation, the the, the nation itself or its government. But politics is government. It is how do people govern themselves? How they how do they settle disputes? What are the laws? What are thing what are prohibited actions? And in another way it can have to do with or it has to do with what is how does a nation state operate? How are people elected? How do they gain authority? What authorities do they have? Now the that is the is side of politics the ought side of politics is or the the ought side of politics deals with how does a what are the values that a system is built on and this is in the political system we get the concept of rights so 
the odd side of a political system is that because a person has, say, a human right, then it is such the case that it, that political system is obligated to defend that right against infringement. And that is the ought side. And so the ought side oftentimes informs in a political system what the is is. Again, going back to Hume's fork and the distinction, the is side of politics is the state. What do we mean by the state? The bureaucracy, the kingdom, the government itself. The ought side is side of Hume's fork versus ought side of Hume's fork. The ought side of Hume's fork in regards to politics is what are the moral principles? What are the imperative principles? What is the metaphysical foundation upon which the nation state is built? Is it on the divine right of kings? Is it on the rights of the man that are instituted imago dei? Are they are, are, are discerned imago dei because they're created in the image of God? Or in somewhat of the communist sense, is it because we say so? Is the and this is where we will see how si certain systems, certain things that we use terms for in our world, oftentimes borrow from two different parts of this conversation to create an amalgamated third. Well, we've talked about politics. Now let's move on to economics. Throughout history, different parts of the world have engaged in different economic systems. We have words like capitalism, socialism, mercantilism. We've got another method of thinking of different political systems, or I'm sorry, economic systems, which is traditional versus command versus market versus mixed. Now, a traditional system in its simplest sense is what you think of when you play a video game. You have markets where people bought, not you, I'm sorry, you don't have markets per se, but you have shopkeepers and people who sell things and you have this very rudimentary proto-agrarian society if you want to think of a traditional economy you think of people more or less kind of engaging in that barter system regardless of whether or not they have money and the end goal and it's, it's, it has less to do with the existence of money itself it has more to do with how how do we describe that system a traditional economic system is in many ways also just a rudimentary economic system. Um, but it also runs aground in a certain description. It runs aground in, in various ways, like uh, it does generally exists in a world where there isn't a division of labor. And this is where you get into a challenge when it comes to academics and how they describe things. But a traditional system, a traditional economic system could probably be also referred to as a primitive or near primitive economic system one different from a market <clears throat> so the primary oper the primary is side the way to look at the economy or economics as the economy is not only the method by which or it is it, okay so economy is not simply like the bank and economy is not simply like the market Economy is the way that people exchange labor and goods and services, as well as property. So the distinction, the way that we draw a line between politics and economics here is politics deals with maybe what we call rights or laws or the state, whereas ec economics deals with property. Now, there is an element where these two interact because you have laws against stealing. But in general, we can think about economics as what do, how does a people perceive property at all? For example, a, dis, a difference between mercantilism and capitalism, one of the key differences between those two economic systems was where the location of ownership was identified. Was it in the sovereignty of the individual that I can own my business or I can own my property? Or is it something like uh, that all things within the land technically fall under fealty to the crown, but they're given is they're they're issued sort of access to the bank being the state, or do they have or are they issued some sort of collaboration with the state itself? 
as methods of expanding the mer the mercantilism of the environment. I said not the mercantilism. Uh, so let's use a world example of it. This would be the era in which Columbus sailed the ocean blue was an era of mercantilism, where Columbus's objective, why he was sponsored by the Spanish king and queen, was that if he was successful, the kingdom of Spain would gain financially from that because all financial systems within Spain at the time were subject to the Spanish crown. And that, though, and that system is different than, say, capitalism, which places the location of ownership in the individual, uh, which can be perhaps even uh, corrupted in many ways. Mercantilism can be corrupted into a form of despotism, but it also, uh, capitalism in its own right can be easily corrupted into forms of, say, um, uh, what one of, the, one of the grievances that people have against a, a capital system is that corporations somehow maintain some sort of identity even though it's not a person. Uh, or it, it, is a, it, it is treated like a person even though it's not really a thing. And so it's not a person itself. And that's just a criticism. But the question then for economy is what is on the other side of Hume's fork? Uh, we'll go back to Hume's fork again. It is science and ought. It is is what the is is, like it is a bridge, versus ought, what the bridge ought do. Why is the bridge there? So if you want to think about it in fundamental questions, what or where are is side questions and why is a ought size side question. Why is it immoral for someone to do X? And so the economic question on the ought side is what are the moral principles upon which a economy is built? And what we've been talking about today is ownership, but also another way of phrasing that is property. And you saw a distinction between mercantilism, capitalism, and then what Marx argued for in his Communist Manifesto was different different ways of understanding the location of ownership and what are the ways that those things should be tied how do we determine ownership is it simply by claim by right is it by uh, means of production if i work the land do i gain property over the land so the is side of econo the economy might be described as property and the ought side of economy is on what principle or how is property dis determined? Why is a thing called property? And economy is, so if you think about it in this way, we're going to go back to war. If politics and war, war on a political scale is war between nation states, this government going to war against that government, certainly we could, we'd have to ask a question is, is the Taliban considered a legitimate government? And if so, did America declare war on a government without going through the, pro the proper means? It's by its own dictatum, whatever. Uh, and then another example of the issue of warfare in states is Napoleonic warfare. The nation of France went to war against the nation of Austria or the nation of Prussia and eventually the nation of Russia. And you saw these armies, the Russian army, the American army, the British army, the British navy, these organizational structures, that is the politics side. Now the economy. The economy might be a market. Markets can be ambiguous, but they might be Wall Street, or they might be Beijing, or they might be uh, an industry, like we're in gun culture, and gun culture is closely affiliated, well, not even really affiliated, just naturally interacting with the firearms industry, it's different, but they interact with. Or you could talk about different forms of industry, different forms of, or different, uh, when people are talking about industries, they're usually more often talking about markets. So you have that subject, and then you can, you would also have to deal with, um, and when, it, when we're talking about economy, is what is economic warfare look like? If I am, uh, this would be the example that's used in recent politics, is if, if, um, the nation or the country of Israel no longer spends its resources to provide food, water, or water and electric to the people of Gaza. Is that a form of war warfare? Yes or no? How you answer that question is the ought side of how you answer that question. And so we're gonna we're gonna kind of move on, but we'll come back to this. Don't worry. 
And so the last one of the three, we've talked about politics, we've talked about economics, and now we need to talk about culture. And culture is certainly the zeitgeist word of today. And that might be a hammer seeing everything as a nail, me being a philosopher dealing with questions of culture and dealing with questions of what is the is side and the ought side of politics, economics, and in this, in this case, culture. I might be prone or accused perhaps even properly of being that hammer that sees everything through a political, I'm sorry, a philosophical or cultural lens in this sense. And in doing so, it is important, it is important for us to start here with how do we draw the difference between philosophy and culture? because this is where those two are going to become the muddiest. They're going to blend together in the most uncomfortable ways. So a culture is oftentimes described as customs, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a given people group. It, could, it might also be described as norms. For example, Christian cultures go to church on Sunday, or uh, American culture celebrates Thanksgiving. It's a holiday to us, and one of a one of the cultural norms is that we cook a turkey and we eat it with our family, and we sit around a table and we think about history. These are cultural norms. They might be holidays. They might be um, expectations. How do you dress? How do you speak to one another? Is it rude to swear in church? Is it something like? How do we drive on the road? Maybe that might be a little bit more of an institution of organization, but this is why I am being somewhat vague because culture is inherently a difficult topic for people to nail down specifically in these easy categories. And people like to take the term culture and then apply it to things that are not cultural things. So. Law is different than culture. Politics is different than culture, but culture impacts politics. And one would be tempted to say that culture is the thing that informs the ought of politics, the ought of economics, and it becomes its own piece. But if we were to look at culture itself and break it in half between the is side of Hume's fork, the is side of the is ought divide, what we would describe in culture are norms. And then if we were to go to the ought side, we would have to ask our, ourselves the question, on what standard or by what principle do we determine norms? This is a very important distinction. Science, the a social science, if you can call them science, because there is a bit of a criticism in the ac ac academies, if you have to attach the word science to it, it might be anything but. But a social science might try to ask the question of how did this cultural norm come to be? You might look at something like uh, entomology, or which it has nothing much less to do with the walking tree key characters from Lord of the Rings, but etymology has to, it's not entomology, it's etymology, geez. Um, etymology has to do with how a word has been used across history. So you would look at, well, the word, uh, famously, Christians bring this up, especially pastors, the word love. Well, the word love was used this way, and then this way, and then this way, and, 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 and it descends through history as different concepts. And so the is side, the social science side of culture is going to look at how cultures have developed, what do they declare as their norms, what are the patterns, what are the statistics, and then it's going to ask, and then it's going to ask how they got there. And so, for example, in the realm of violence, a cultural norm is that inner city Chicago has a higher threshold of the norm of violence than, say, rural Idaho or Appalachia in that sense. And, and the question is, why? Why might be a ought side of the divide? And then how? How did it become that way versus why is it that way or why ought it to be that way? Um, and so we're going to, how and why are kind of different questions. Remember, we, this is where it gets really, really, this is where the work of philosophy gets a little bit more specific. How is one question? Why is another? How will it has to deal with how it became that way and why it is that way 
has to do with what are the things by which the people, what are the values by which people hold that institute that produce that outcome? Why do they do, why do people act the way that they do is different than how did the environment get become such that they acted in such ways? And so for culture, for, finally in culture, we do we get to easily distinguish culture into cultural systems? Yes, but no. No, I think this is where culture dis distinguishes itself from uh, politics and economics. Culture does not have systems. It doesn't, we don't, we don't, if it, at best you could describe it as things like Judeo-Christian, Muslim, or Buddhist, but now you're talking about organized religions. And that would be the best way that you would get an ought side of culture is to look at religion or even more specifically the cultural norms of a people when collected and documented are what we would call a religion and so when a person exists within what we call a multicultural environment there are i'm sorry when a person exists within a multicultural environment and then describes themselves as multicultural and follows the cultural norms of multiculturalism their functional religion is multiculturalism and this becomes an issue for muslims christians buddhists and other people with various different belief systems that do not hold to the worldview that all belief systems are equally truthful now equally truthful versus equally valid are different statements but what we have to deal with here is the issues with things like multiculturalism or even for some examples atheism um, and that is what are the norms upon which a culture is organized and then the ought side of the question is by what standard and this is why you'll hear people talk about things like politics is downhill from culture and in another words economics is also downhill from culture but what then really is culture what is the source of culture how do you answer the question of why should why ought why ought people act according to certain norms why should it be not only a legal prohibition and an economic disincentive but also a cultural norm against something like stealing because something informs the economy that stealing is not only a method but a bad uh, maybe an immoral method but something also informs a political system that the existence of property and it being stolen is an issue that's something that need, that needs to be addressed it's something that needs to be codified and so if your cultural system does not believe in or does not have a system by which it understands what things ought be for people, how we ought live, you will have a failing economy and you'll have a failing political system on top of that. And one way that we see this happening in our world today is that we have tried to create a world in the West that cuts out all of the material by which people answer that question by invalidating it or rendering it to be rendering it into merely a fashion statement it turns your cultural aughts into fashion statements while subverting your worldview by digging in underneath your foundation and placing a lie there that all things can be true at the same time and then it expects a fruitful society to grow from that. It expects a fruitful society to be raised on the bodies of millions that don't function as fertilizer, but rather is the destruction of your values. You must kill your gods in order to be multiculturalism. The problem is when you kill your gods, you kill all reason for life, and thus we have the loss of value of human life in 20 and 2023 whether it comes from the way that our culture reacted to various various um you know cultural endemics i guess pandemics whatever you want to call it uh or the way that we view various activities in our environment be it abortion murder uh, or even 
looting in a sense. And so this, these are issues that we deal with on a national scale, international scale, on a cultural scale. It kind of explains that. So let's go back to war. If we look at war, war is a thing that people have tried to put in a bottle. Von Clausewitz tried to contain war into a political sphere. War was simply violence and, and vi violence and use of force between nation states. And it was the use of force that, pre, uh, that presupposed the existence of nation states. But what happens when you have a stateless nation? You have a people like, say, the Kurds or the Taliban or uh, the American right whatever, that are not necessarily a state in themselves, but they are engaged in conflict with other people. Now, if you look at the American political system, we have to look at various issues with the way that the right and left deal with it, because the, this might be the right seeing themselves as being attacked by a political system, and that justifies their right and desire to be armed in the event that that attack turns from something that is superficial and bearable to unbearable and maybe warranting a reaction. This is just a, an observation of what, say, formats of right-wing politics might look like. Whereas the left, though, and the left has moved on, the, the left, in a sense, has ascended past mere politics, but it is engaged in the Maoist version of the culture war. And in between both of these is the economy. And we have seen cases and examples of what look like economic warfare in our world. For example, the nation state of China might send, uh, might send chemists and sell materials to a non-state actor, being that of cartels in Mexico, and it will employ them or implore them or incentivize them to produce a drug called fentanyl, upon which it will be trafficked into the United States, providing great, excellent financial gain for those who are trafficking it, trafficking it at the detriment of the culture, even escalating into cases where a certain individual in Minnesota consumed that product at the pinnacle point or at a key point where a, a cultural grievance could be identified and manipulated to cause an American civil conflict. Now, this isn't to suggest that China orchestrated the entire 2020 concept of our 2020 summer of love, but what you could see here is that China as a government, a, a, a communist government, which is a closed economy or a controlled economy or a command economy, uses that force that it controls within its own economy to incentivize corporations that are Chinese corporations to sell chemicals to an organization that is a non-state actor in Mexico, knowingly or knowingly and even supporting the facilitation of the outcome. So they might look the other way when people are, uh, when chemists enter into China or Mexico, Chinese chemists enter into Mexico, or maybe not even Chinese by nationality or by ethnicity, but by whatever influence enter into Mexico, and then they support them by helping them refine the product that is fentanyl. And then the Mexican cartel, which is a non-state actor, which can you, can, if it's a non-state actor, can you go to war against it? Uh, the answer is, well, how do you define war? And that non-state actor then traffics that chemical into the United States, causing hundreds of thousands of people to die every year, as well as a, a great financial burden on the United States, but also in the case of George Floyd, creating a cultural flashpoint at which maybe even Chinese propaganda could cause or so further division in the United States, or even more catastrophically, they could fund their own people within the American government who would then pay their own money or crowdsource money, who knows where, to produce a financial incentive or benefit to those who are engaging in civil unrest or even light versions of domestic terrorism in the United States. So if this whole this whole thing is observed, does that constitute warfare? 
That is why we are engaging in this question as a community and as individuals and as a culture, because how we answer this question not only cuts to the quick of what our identity is, but how we perceive the world. And it forces us to answer difficult questions that prior generations either were not for faced with or simply refused to answer. Still, this is the burden of living. And so we have seen a version of economic warfare. If I can cripple your market, if your market exists within your environment and I can cripple your market, is that not considered economic warfare? If the ATF will follow a, un, a, a knowingly illegal action to make the brace illegal of sorts, the brace ruling, and that the result of that brace ruling is an economic impact on American culture, could that be determined as warfare? Now, why we present this question is because regardless of whether or not YouTube likes to censor it, our government doesn't like us thinking about it, or whether our education system even equips us to do it, this is the burden of being a free peoples. If we want to call ourselves free men, if we want to say that we are men of character, and yet we refuse to answer or even consider these questions, which may take years of on again, off again thinking to figure it out, if we refuse to address these questions or we are tempted by simplified ish and simplified versions of it, uh, regardless of whether we like to, we will be held to some moral standard regarding them, whether by our state or by whatever we believe to be our moral standard. And so the final question though, and as we've talked about politics, war in view of politics, war in view of economics, now let's talk about war in view of culture. If I am deliberately trying to change your culture, does it constitute warfare? This is where the term culture war might come out of. If I am willing to, let's just say, incentivize or plant or put people in your culture, let's just say you have a church and people are people enter that church, some of them perhaps for the deliberate intent of capturing that institution and turning it into something else, is that considered cultural warfare? If the communists decided, which is an economic and a political system, decided to send culture warriors into the American academic system for the express purpose of capturing that ac academic system, that, that cultural system of the academy, and corrupting it from within, would that be considered a format of warfare? And this is where, this is, again, that question, how do we understand these things? And so if it does, if we come to the conclusion that the institutions, that the cultural institutions, our customs, our arts, our social institutions, and our achievements, say our statues, or our, the way our language, or our music, or whatever we want to call about it, if those things are being invaded or colonized by an outside force whether or not their branding is on point is beyond the re beyond the pale does that constitute warfare and if so what are the rules of engagement and for us as a culture this is your very clear call to action i don't want to veil it in anything if you are existing in this world, if you are a participant in American society, where you uh, may not be a lawyer, you may not be a doctor, you may not be an economist, but you are a citizen of the United States, your participation in culture is not something that you can abdicate from. Demoralization would be an effective tool on crippling a culture by means of discouraging those people from participating and where you participate where you participate is in your communities whether they are ones that you have voluntarily participated in or ones that are things like your school system your church your environment and so the way to defeat a society and capture its institutions is to demoralize its own citizens from participation at all and then thus the call to action is this if you want this to be your land and you want this to be your culture and the community that you live in and your children grow up in 
you must actively participate in it. If you are unwilling to participate in said culture, it will be determined by people other than you, and your children will grow up in it. And it doesn't mean that we go out and view every single cultural slight as a violent institution or, infl or, or application of violence. It doesn't mean that we go out into the world and we just fight everything tooth and nail. It means that, we, that if we are going to call ourselves as ones within a culture war, we better act like it. And for those who are valiant on the front lines, so to speak, that is why, the, for those people, I, I guess I want to encourage you. Uh, your work is not going unnoticed. We are, our place in this battle is not being forgotten. And then, like anything that you see in, say, special operations or the military, people who are trying to claim the valor of in of participating in this in in gun culture let's just say who have no participation will be treated with a similar disdain to somebody who steals valor from the military in other words do not claim to be something you're not and the nice thing too with that is that the invitation is welcome there is no one pro prohibiting you from participating in culture what value can you add well let's find out so, in summary, today we've talked about politics, economics, and culture from the perspective, or we've talked about three these three different terms, politics, economics, and culture, and we've looked at the is side of each of them. The is of politics is the state. The ought of politics might be the rights of man. The, uh, the is of ec economics might be the market or property. The ought of economics is upon what foundation do we even have or determine property and then the is of culture is norms and the ought of culture might be something closer to religion and all three of these things come together and that is how we perceive our world every interaction that we participate in every transaction that we make every law that we follow or break all exist within these three concepts politics, economics, and culture. And finally, we've talked about them in phrases of warfare and violence. Von Clausewitz famously thought of war as a political thing, a political action. Uh, there is also economic warfare, crippling a people's economy. And then there is cultural war, which might be to subvert or destroy or replace somebody's culture, maybe colonialism. And that is the material that we are going to continue be, to focus on because I would like to talk about the difference between warrior culture and civilian culture next. That being the case, if this has been beneficial to you, leave a comment down below if you're on YouTube. If you are on Spotify, we appreciate the uh, leaving us a review. Uh, but what we, where we are at most importantly right now is we are in a growth period. We are trying to hit... Let's see, let's bring that up real quick. We are trying to hit 10,000 people on Instagram by the end of the year, and we are getting there steadily. But you're, we can't do that without you. We can't do that without this community. And we are looking to grow as we are trying to turn what we're doing here at Redacted away from being a subsidized project into something that we can do more than just full-time. I mean, we're doing it in this kind of weird f double full-time activity right now, and uh, it's... It's tight. So it's tough. And so we're making it work as we do. But if, we, uh, if we've added value to you, leave a comment below. You know how it works. As uh, as admin result says, it is a courtesy to the YouTube gods. Otherwise, you can support us on Instagram or you can head over to Instagram. Please follow us up there. And then if you actually want to support this product, and if you want to support this project and jump into some of the backside conversations as well as see more like the gear reviews and the, the, the more gun culture-y stuff, you can head over to redactedculture.locals.com. And with that, we say, go forth and conquer.